Hi, everyone. Welcome to Open Source Data uh, Summit 2024. We were here last year at the keynote, giving a you know covering a broad overview of open source data. I'm excited to be here again today. And today we picked a topic that is very pertinent to the times that we live in. We will focus on your data platform and some tectonic shifts that are happening around them. To quickly introduce myself, I'm Vinod. I'm currently working at a startup I founded, One House, which is bringing truly open, wicked fast data lake courses for everyone. My backgrounds in databases, data lakes, and data systems. I built some of the earliest data lake house tech, built the world's first data lake house, continuing to work on new technology areas around data interoperability. And I have, you know, uh, close to 15 years of open source uh, development and uh, being uh, part of some, uh, you know, data infra journeys at some of these big internet companies and uh, learned a ton from them. All right, let's dive in to today's agenda. First, we introduce this notion of an unburned data platform, and we'll summarize some key evolutionary shifts that are happening in the cloud data stack and how these two relate to each other. Then we'll put these together and hopefully design a blueprint for your next data platform, listing its advantages and why the value that you can be getting out of them. We'll cover some success stories from real world of uh, you know companies that have reaped benefits of doing building such a data platform. And then we'll talk about like, you know, the future and kind of what, what uh, where everything's headed. All right, first, let's ground ourselves. What is unbundling? So unbundling a product stack uh, simply means that you're breaking it up into composable components. Each of them are specialists in some functionality. The, the classic and the iconic example here is how, if anybody still remembers Spike List, you know, it's a popular site. Uh, and how it got unbundled by all these different companies, focusing a, uh, on an individual vertical and building a really good experience. So this helps the overall, uh, you know, experience, the product experience become better and deeper as well, right? So this applied to a data platform means you're decoupling storage, compute, query engines, and all the different data tools that you're using. And these uh, different components would then, you know, interrupt Right, seamlessly with one another. So it's like you're building a data platform from, you know, like your data Lego blocks. So what are, what are these blocks? And like, you know, what are the different trends and technologies that you should even consider, right? And as you can see, we live in an age where there are lots of use cases for data compared to let's say a decade ago where we're, you know, broadly running, you know, BI and reporting, right? So you need to make a lot of choices carefully and weigh them uh, before you build your data platform. And your choices matter, right? They will literally make or break your data platform. And there are a lot of these data trends as we saw, and each of them typically goes through like a peak, uh, like a trough and it kind of like stabilizes, right? And data has gravity in inertia. So you can't like, you know, change these things and make these hard foundational choices many times. So it's very important to kind of you know invest the time early on so we can advance you know the technology and you're building the data platform uh you know without going through these like peaks and troughs and other emotional roller coaster. For example, the significant investment in AI right now and picking a data platform, for example, that does not scale well for vector embeddings that needs constant updation would burn a big hole in your budget, right? So when the budget gets tighter. Right. So that's a, that's a good example of thinking ahead. Now let's actually break down your data platform into generic components and see you know, the, the differences between the two models. So broadly speaking, a data platform, you have storage and then this compute, which is like a, you know, like a Kubernetes or some compute environment in which you run processing queries on top of it. You have your actual query engines, your process, data processing frameworks, and all of your data management that is required to manage your, uh, you know, like your data platform. And then a catalog ultimately connects all these things together, makes the data discoverable, trackable, governable, and lets different of these engines access them, right? So if we now compare on the left, a traditional bundled proprietary platform in, you know, if you want to reference, think about something like a data warehouse, so typically the storage is locked to closed data formats, although like, you know, increasingly some of them are supporting open formats. Uh, the compute, where the compute runs is typically controlled completely by the vendor. And you're tied to one query engine or one SQL runtime. And your catalog and the metadata that it tracks about your data is locked away and typically tied to this one engine and this one vertical stack. 
if you now contrast this approach to an unbundled open platform, you can pick any data you know, format, file format, table format, any of these things for your storage. You can bring your own compute or a cluster or use a vendor's managed compute. You have the freedom of choice to do that. And you can query, like, you know, query or manage this data with any engineering tool, open or closed. So, that, so again, you have that uh, freedom to choose. And you're uh, able to actually interoperate with many catalogs, many engines. So, so like this approach feels like a breath of fresh air to managing data in a kind of like a sustainable way for the long term, right? So through this, you minimize vendor lock-in because you have separate, you know, swappable components. You are free to choose the best of breed tech. You have a modular architecture. So your teams can be picking the right technology for the right uh, workloads. For example, you can pick the right table format for your right patterns. You can democratize your data because your teams can be using their own favorite tools. Say, let's say the marketing team uses uh, a data warehouse, they can still stick to that, still on the same copy of the data. Innovation, so this is very important. It affects like the users indirectly, but this lets open source projects like let's say ours innovate for you, right? For example, we were able to build a hoodie project, make storage transformations 10x faster than warehouses for over a thousand companies today because of this open stack and because of the fact that we were able to actually uh, you know, deploy this technology into an unbundled stack like this. Right? So this part is very, very important as well. So this all sounds good, but before we get into building, like, you know, go jump ahead, let's, let's do some due diligence, try to understand what's going on around the different cloud data platforms that exist already. So we make sure that we are building along the right trends. The headline is the data warehouse, which was the system of record and the pl data platform for you know, many decades is, not, is necessary, still super relevant for BI and reporting the traditional use cases, but new use cases don't fit very well on the, lake, the warehouse side. So the alternators is to replicate a data platform for each of these use cases. That turns out to be a huge pain in the neck as well and can be, you know, lead to massive duplication of data. You are writing these, you know, expensive transformations on multiple platforms. You have to hire a lot more people, a lot bigger teams to ensure consistency across all of these different platforms. This can be extremely frustrating and expensive for your teams. Luckily though, we seem to be converging on a better way to go about this. And a quick history sidebar on data platforms is, Almost till like the 2000s, right? In the last century, I think, we were using relational databases or specialized relational databases on-prem data warehouses to do this, right? And then when we got into social networks and like, you know, the ML wave, we built a lot of like Hadoop installations. We did a lot of data science was born. And with cloud, all of this has simply migrated to these, you know, Spark data platforms in the cloud or cloud data warehouses. What's really now happened in the last five years is they've now started to converge because it was a pretty unnatural separation between uh, like, you know, the warehouse and the, the Hadoop data lake, if you will, um, because you already pay for S3 and like, you know, kind of like compute and storage separately on the cloud. So all in all, you know, the conver there's a, we are in a tick of a convergence towards an open uh, data lake house as this like new data foundation and all execs and leaders from hyperscalers or leading vendors, uh, you know, kind of are finally aligned there as well. The outcome is the open data lake house with its power and flexibility, you know, it has already supports storing data in like open you know, file formats, data formats, table formats, there are like interoperability layers which make the data accessible to all the engines. All of this already, you know, evolved, um, ground up from the open source community. And building an architecture like this where you're ingesting and transforming and preparing your data for downstream consumption using like, you know, an open data lake house can guarantee a lot of, you know, like future proofness and a uh, lot of uh, interoperability and a lot of you know benefits that help you wrangle with this complexity ultimately, right? So now let's take an open data lake house and what we learned about unbundling and we're ready to now put this together and see what your new data platform can look like. First, before any design exercise, let's state our goals very clearly. We want open storage, 
for all kinds of data, structure on structure, which means we want to keep our data on cloud storage. It's been like, you know, most of the trends are moving towards having source of truth data on cloud storage in open formats, right? We don't want to go through um, having proprietary data formats and uh, kind of like migrations and whatnot. So, and we want interoperability for this data across any engine that may come up. That way new engines can come up and access your data. Second is, you know, staying free of compute lock-in. So we talk about data lock-in a lot, but compute lock-in is probably like worse, right? Because you should be able to build using open source components, uh, cloud agnostic components for your compute, as well as be able to buy proprietary components and mix and match them together for time, faster time to value. And you should be able to control that uh, choice. Third, efficiency of the platform as data scales. It's very, very hard to backport efficient, efficiency into a platform that didn't exist there, right? So as your data volume increases, I think uh, you know your cost shouldn't be scaling non-linearly. And finally, new engines will come up. So you need the ability to swap components in and out and no crazy painful data migration costs. So with this in mind, uh, if we now take the initial components that we saw, the generic components that we saw in a data platform and uh, like go one level deeper, we end up with all these different like components in, a, in the unbundled data platform. And we'll cover them in like, you know, short um, form one by one. So first central to everything is storage. There you have a ton of file formats, um, you know, open formats on which you can be either storing data or they're, you know, used to store cache the data or you can build indexes. Ultimately, uh, you know, a table format ties all these different files together into a table, table snapshot, different versioning and all of that. So this gives you meaningful storage on top of, you know, your cloud storage buckets to kind of work with individual data sets, right? So on top of them, you have the metadata or catalog layer, which broadly track different kinds of metadata and uh, you know stuff that you need to govern the data that you're in storage. So you and these catalogs even come in different flavors, right? So there you have your operational catalogs, which are like meta stores, which mean they are used by query engines and all these tools to plan faster. They store technical metadata, statistics, and all those like internal databasey stuff. Then you have interoperability layers that have come up, uh, which make like you know easy to read and write different table formats or you know uh, seamlessly uh, across each other. You have your data governance catalogs. You have like a lot of things, uh, you know, catalogs and servers that help you share data securely with your own customers and with other parts of your business. And on the left, you have a lot of data management functionality, right? So be it your you know, workflow schedulers that are scheduling like jobs and tasks that are going on on your data, operating on your data, the actual transformations in ETL frameworks that are transforming your data, um, you know, data optimization, you need constantly need to optimize your data for better, uh, you know, for compliance or even like better performance, right, in the background. And you need obviously data ingestion capabilities to first bring your data into your data platform and also reverse ETL to move data out of your data platform, right? On the right, finally, you know, these are uh, engines that you use to consume your data for different use cases. You have the analytics engines, you have your data warehouses, you have all these data frame libraries, which people use to write, you know, data science algorithms and like process and shift through data pretty quickly. And uh, of course, there's a lot of ML, AI training frameworks and whatnot that work on your data. And then a lot of databases actually directly query data on cloud storage, right? So again, uh, you know, you, standardizing on this kind of like a storage stack has immense benefits and reduces the amount of overhead you need to manage your data platform. Now, now that we define all these components, we have a huge variety of selection to choose from for each of these components, right? So for open storage, for, for example, you can pick choices that support different, you know, write and query performance needs. You can you have Parquet, ORC, file formats, you have Hoodie, Iceberg, Delta Lake, which are table formats. And you also have like Xtable, Uniform, which are, you know, building interoperability across them. Uh, for B analytics, you have like these cloud data warehouses, you know, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, which are the most popular. 
uh, interactive analytics, you have, you know, different query engines like, uh, you know, managed ones, cloud managed ones like Athena or, you know, open source ones like ClickHouse, Trino, Starux. Streaming, uh, if you want to process data before it gets into the data platform, you can use Flink, Kafka, Red Panda, Pulsar to store streams and process streams and emit more streams. You can use a technology like Pino to query your uh, you know, your your streams pretty quickly as well. And of course, Debezium we'll see you can use to build, uh, you know, consume data from databases. You have your frameworks for writing code and like, you know, kind of like building your ML models and all of that, you know, deal crunch unstructured data, if you will. So Databricks, Ray, you know, of course, your vector databases and different, you know, uh, data science, Python data processing frameworks all do a great job at this. ETL, like, you know, we'll, we'll always have a need for transforming data and Spark and some of these like, you know, DVD and uh, the cloud Spark platforms basically do a great job at kind of data transformation in a very cost-effective way. We have catalogs that provide anything from discovery, lineage and access controls. You know, Hive Metastore is the whole, you know, warhorse I would say, like purely built in open source. It's an operational catalog. There are also new things like Unity Catalog coming up, and there are also cloud provider uh, provider managed offerings around like data catalogs, right? Uh, well, which kind of straddle the line between operational and um, kind of you know governance in some cases. Uh, there are lots of workflow schedulers. Uh, you know, you can write complex workflows for transforming your data, and uh, you know, Airflow, Prefect, Daxter are some of them. And uh, yeah, I need to catch a breath, but I only covered some notable examples here. And as you can see, uh, these largely you can swap them in and out. And just to like prove that, let's now tailor a data platform, uh, you know, hypothetical data platform for our needs. This actually is a really good uh, real world example as well. If you want it for real, go ahead. Um, let's build a data platform for BI and data science, two use cases using only open source components, right? Um, and now, you know, here is how it could go. You could pick, uh, you know, like a workflow schedule like Airflow, express all your transformations using something like DBT. So it becomes like super easy to track lineage, models, maintenance, and all of this. Then you can actually use an engine like Spark or Flink to write your transformations. Those are the engines that will actually execute, uh, in, you know, your, your transformations. Um, Apache Hoodie that, you know, we closely work and, uh, you know, contribute to uh, is a data lakehouse platform where it comes up with a lot of managed services that help you optimize your data constantly as, you know, writes and transformations are happening on them. And of course, it also helps with like the combination of a Kafka, Hoodie and Debezium. You can capture data from pretty much like any streaming data, any database change captures. You can capture and bring them into this, uh, you know, table format storage, right? And there again, you can imply, you know, Parquet is very popular columnar storage format, but there's ORC, there's like tons of other open file formats in use as well. And you you can use all of them and you can, you know, you can pick something like Hoodie, which has indexes to help speed up queries or speed up writes. And you could still be having, you know, interoperability, sorry, um, through Apache X table, and have this data be exposed in like, you know, Iceberg and Delta Lake, and you can mix and match these table formats. Uh, the only real open source operational catalog we have is the Hive Meta Store. And then you can use something like Data Hub for your data governance. On the right, finally, you could, you could be consuming this data using an you know, analytics engine like Starox or a data open source data warehouse like ClickHouse or you can be using Spark or Dask to just like, you know, do a lot of data science processing and, uh, you know, kind of build build out, analyze your data, right? So, and we don't, it doesn't stop here, right? There are plenty of real world examples of this design in action and we're gonna now quickly flash through all of them. First, Uber's data stack is kind of like interesting to study. Uh, so they have a 250 petabyte enterprise data lake built on Apache Hoodie, all data stored in like, you know, Avro or Parquet open data formats and all data management is done through these open compute services, right? And they employ multiple query engines like Spark Hive for ETL, Flink for stream processing, Presto for interactive queries, and like have a Hive meta store extended for kind of this access control R back as this external catalog layer. And 
Second one is Walmart, Walmart's Fortune One. And then they they have like craftfully balanced a warehouse and a data lake. So they have an open data lake house that delivers great data freshness uh, on top of open data formats. Then they use Spark for scalable batch and stream processing, a BigQuery for warehousing still, and then Presto and Trino for like reducing some costs if for some of these interactive queries uh, over warehousing as I understand it. And then they use uh, like all of these like open source catalog sync services in Hoodie to sort of sync this data to a data proc catalog, a big query catalog, essentially multiple catalogs. So they have like a lot of optionality in bringing like new engines on top. This is a great example of you know going from a bundled uh, you know traditional data platform or built on a data warehouse and a proprietary ingestion tool to a more unbundled one using some of the technologies that we just discussed. And it uses, you end up, you know, using the same data for, you know, mix and match of open compute using Spark for AI use cases. And then you use, uh, you know, still use like a data warehouse for analytics, right? And this actually, you know, is a lot of cost savings, a lot of like, you know, latency direction, um, a lot of resiliency, you unlock new use cases. This is a pretty, pretty cool uh, you know, engineering effort. There are also companies that are showing us why this is essential for innovation and bringing new ideas to market, right? This whole unbundling. So uh, going back to my previous example, right? So uh, this is an example of Nielsen where they're, they were able to like experiment with a data lake house to serve um, some of these vector search queries and stuff, especially like database. And again, like they're able to do it because of these like opens, you know, this unbundling, this decoupling between storage and compute, and that lets them customize some of these things for specialized needs, right? So now let's look ahead and see what uh, lies right ahead for us. All said and done, there are some significant work going on and uh, much needed work to make uh, such an architecture possible, right? First, um, better support for unstructured data, right? Like, you know, we can choose an open data lake house as a foundation, but, you know, um, but we need to blend and add a lot of support for unstructured data formats. And I think that will kind of complete the picture and make this layer, the storage layer support all kinds of data, like much, much better. Um, file formats, uh, we need like new file formats that are good at serving point lookups, short lookups for model serving, indexing these needs. And there's a ton of like, you know, uh, ongoing work going on around all of these. So we have, uh, you know, like specialized uh, block specialized uh, columnar formats. And we, for example, we've been investing in a SS table like a uh, row based format for this uh, point short lookup use case that I mentioned. And uh, it's still like, as you can see, right, this is, this is great, but it's still, you need to integrate a few components to get, get this uh, unbundled data stack built for you. So we're also like, you know, kind of looking at how we can extend. That's probably uh, increase the cohesion between all these components in the unbundled data lake house and lower the bar for getting fully open source data lake houses up and running. And finally, um, this decoupled storage, now that we've decoupled the storage from all these engines, now the, the catalogs, which are kind of closely tied to these engines, also uh, need to kind of like talk to each other, right? So most operational catalogs are closed and they are owned by the, you know, the respective engines and the open source options like high meta store are getting outdated. So there's a lot of ongoing work around this, right? Which is, you know, uh, broadly around catalog interoperability uh, in, in these projects, uh, which is, and, and there are like new open source um, catalogs that are coming up. Uh, the cool thing is all of these projects have like talks later today. And I think uh, if you're interested in this topic, I think you should go to the next table talk or the hoodie on dot talk, or there's the panel where people from like Polaris and unity are also talking about like some of these challenges. So that'll be like a great place to be later today. So what is one house doing in this problem space? Right? So we, so broadly what we do is uh, you know, we, provide managed services that can replace these components in the stack, which is essentially we can, we support ingestion, ELT, and you can prepare and like transform your data incrementally. And we also centrally manage all these, uh, you know, data that we store. 
and the storage is pretty much like exactly how we discussed it before. It 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 goes across different you know file formats, table formats, and data formats, and all of that. And we have like a nice control plane which can like do configuration management and make the the goal is to in, get the data in, transform, prepare it for all the different use cases on the right, and all these components that you see in red are unbundled and swappable, like we discussed with the open source equivalents. For example, you can be ingesting using one house or using open source tools, and you can still manage that uh, you know table data using one house managed data ma management layer. So you can like mix and match different components to be open or uh, you know proprietary or like you know managed. So that's like a pretty pretty interesting uh, experience. Finally, if you're considering your next data platform, build it on an open data lake house, unbundle your storage from any one engine, like engines will change all the time, provide a modular architecture where the single source of truth on cloud storage is you know, accessible from any, any engine that you may need now or in the future. And preserve your freedom to run your compute anywhere. Like I said, compute lock-in is like very hard to get out of as well, so pay attention to that. And bake in efficiency from the start, right? And then leverage like, you know, better techniques like incremental processing, efficient data management to, to get ahead of the curve. When it comes to efficiency, it's gonna be very hard to retrofit this later on. But finally, huge thank you for being here and, uh, you know, uh, listening to this talk. Now, uh, maybe you'll all go build your Lego lake houses and maybe it looks, as beautiful as this. Uh, finally, uh, we have a lot more. We're just getting started today. Enjoy your day uh, at Open Source Data Summit 2024. There's some fantastic talks and speakers ahead. I just listed my my picks and my favorites and things that I'm, you know, not uh, wanting to miss. So yeah, have a nice day and thanks for being here.